Hello again from Digicore Things. This video follows on from my earlier Minimalist Europe Card Bus videos. For MECB, to date I've designed and built a backplane, a prototype card and a TMS 9929A video card. The next logical step is to create my first CPU card. My MECB modular design project originated from the rediscovery of my Motorola 6809 Wirewrap Europe card based CPU board, which I designed back in the early 1980s. You can watch my earlier videos exploring this board if you're interested in more detail. As a result, it's not surprising that I'd create my first CPU card around my favourite retro 8 bit CPU, the 6809. Effectively, my MECB design journey has really kicked off by me taking my original 6809 Wirat board and updating it into a modular PCB based design, also implementing the flexibility required to support experimenting with different system configurations and memory maps. Essentially, the original Wirat CPU board is being split into a modular two card design, putting the CPU and memory onto one card and the input and output onto a second card. Both cards are then reunited by the MECB backplane, where other cards can then be added for experimenting with, for example the previously built TMS 9929A video card. Whereas the original 80s Wirat board had only 2 kilobytes of RAM and 4 kilobytes of ROM, the new CPU card will have on board a full 64K of RAM and a generous 32K of ROM. This allows the flexible chip select logic to be configured however we decide for allocating this available memory into the CPU's 64K address space. For example, one relatively common memory map might give the first 56K of address space to RAM and the top 8K to ROM. You could even choose to exclude the onboard memory if, for example, a page memory card was later added. So there's plenty to play with. So let's dive into the KiCad schematic. As you can see, the CPU card is dominated by the CPU chip, a single byte wide static RAM chip, which can either be a 64 kilobyte 32 pin skinny dip or a pinout compatible 32 kilobyte 28 pin skinny dip. Also, we have a single 32 kilobyte 28 pin flash ROM. In addition, we have a standard crystal oscillator, a SMIT trigger based reset circuit, and our flexible Glue Logic PLD chip. Finally, we have a comparator and an 8-way dual inline switch to allow selection of a memory mapped I.O. address space to exist in any 256 byte page of the 64k address space. This implements the MECB bus I.O. request signal I.O. REQ. Note that as per my original Wirat board, this first CPU card design is based around the original internal clock version of the 6809 chip, that is, the non-E suffix version of the CPU. This was to remain true to my original 80s design and is also due to me having several of these internal clock 6809 chips in my old part storage. But you may have noticed from a couple of my recent videos that I've had some difficulty finding a source for non-E suffix 6809 or 6309 CPUs. Even the chips I ordered that were clearly marked as non-E variants turned out to actually be remarked E suffix external clock CPU chips. Because of this, I will be making my second CPU card design an external clock 6809E or 6309E CPU card. This will effectively be the same design, just with the addition of the required quadrature clock generator and perhaps some other updates. But otherwise, it will be functionally equivalent to this non E variant CPU card design. But before I get ahead of myself, Let's return our focus to this initial 6809 or 6309 CPU card design. So let's take a look at the PCB layout. As per my previous MECB videos, I created this KiCad project by using the standard MECB KiCad template that I'd created earlier. This sped up the process significantly by letting me start off with a predefined PCB with mounting holes and with the bus connector etc already in place. As you can see, the rest of the PCB layout came together relatively nicely. 
with plenty of space available on the MECB standard 100mm square PCB size to allow for relatively easy trace routing with a simple and cost effective two layer board. So these PCBs were ordered from JLC PCB and here they are. So let's have a look at one. There's the underside. And if I turn it over. There's the component side. So let's put the first one together. I'll start off with the resistor and capacitors, as well as the two single inline resistor packs. Then I'll solder in the IC sockets, including an 8-pin IC socket that I've modified for the crystal. 4-pin crystal sockets are relatively expensive, but you can modify a regular round-pin IC socket for the purpose by just popping out the centre 4 pins, leaving just the 4 corner pins. Also soldered in is the ROM write-enabled 2-pin header. Then I'll solder in the 8-way dual inline switch and the momentary reset switch. Finally, the male DIN 41612 MECB bus connector, which is secured in place with a couple of 10mm M2.5 bolts. So with that quick assembly completed, without me boring you with my soldering, we are nearly ready for some testing. So let's get some of the ICs inserted. Okay, first the hex smit trigger inverter. Let's just straighten the legs and put them in place. Then the 74HCT688 8 bit comparator. Then a 64K byte static RAM. So these are a W24512, 150 nanosecond speed. So these are 32 pin skinny dip. There we go. Then now internally clocked 6809 chip. Now what I'm using is a actually a 68B09, so it's good for up to two two megahertz clock speed. And this is one of the chips I've had in my parts drawer for many years. Probably bought it way back in the 80s. Let's Lastly, for now I'll use a 4 MHz oscillator to run the CPU at 1 MHz. And that'll just pop into the modified 8 pin IC socket. Right, so that just leaves um, our PLD and a ROM chip before we can test our CPU board. So next we'll program the PLD chip. For a CPU card, the PLD chip usage is a little modified as compared to the standardized PLD pin usage that I had outlined in an earlier video. The standardized PLD pin usage 
described in the earlier video was specifically for PLD use on peripheral cards where the bus signals are all acting as PLD inputs for generating up to three peripheral chip select outputs. In the case of a CPU card, the PLD is still used for generating flexible chip select outputs, but for a CPU card we also use the PLD for generating some of the bus signals which originate from a CPU card. So let's take a look at the PLD chip configuration. Okay, we've got our standard header. Firstly, we'll define the PLD input pins. For the CPU card, we're using 10 pins for inputs. First, we have the active low I.O. address output from the 748CT688 8-bit comparator. Then we have the CPU's E and Q clock signals and the CPU's read-write signal. And finally, we have the top six lines of the address bus. This allows the PLD to select memory address space down to one kilobyte boundaries. Next, we define the PLD output pins. For the CPU card, we are using the remaining eight I.O. pins as outputs. These include the usual pin 14, 15 and 16 allocations for up to three chip select outputs. For this card, we will define these for the ROM and RAM chip select with one unused spare. The remaining five output pins are used to generate the MECB bus signals that originate from a CPU card. These are the memory request, clock, I.O. request and the separated read and write signals. With the pins assigned, we can now look at the simple logic used to define the outputs based on the status of the relevant input pins. I've summarized all of this in the comments. Firstly, the memory request output is active low and is asserted when the I.O. address signal is high, i.e. not active, while either the E or Q clock signals are high. Then the clock output is set to follow the CPU's E clock signal. The ROM chip select is an active low output and is asserted when memory request is asserted, and address lines A15, A14 and A13 are all high. This equates to the top 8 kilobytes of memory address space from E000 to FFFF. The RAM chip select is an active low output and is asserted when memory request is asserted and address lines A15, A14 and A13 are not all high. This equates to the bottom 56 kilobytes of memory address space from 000 to DFFF. The spare chip select pin is not connected on the PCB but I've just allocated it as an active low output when I.O. request is asserted. That is, it just follows the I.O. request output pin. We then have the I.O. request output pin, which is active low and asserted when the I.O. address signal is low, i.e. active, while either the E or Q clock signals are high. As you'll note, this is the opposite to the memory request signal. So either the memory request or the I.O. request signals are asserted during a high E or Q clock signal, depending on the state of the I.O. address signal that defines the 256 byte page of the address space that we have allocated for I.O. address device use. Finally, we have the active low read and write output signals, which simply split the 6809 CPU's combined read-write signal and asserts only during the E clock signal's high period. So we're now ready to compile this PLD definition and program the PLD chip with the output .jid file. If you're interested in how this was done, then please view my earlier video where I discussed in more detail the address to code GlueLogic ATF16V8 use and programming. Now we'll get the programmed PLD chip inserted. This just leaves the ROM chip. As we don't yet have any I.O., a standard monitor ROM isn't going to be of any use to us, as we currently have no serial interfaces to allow talking to the CPU card. Instead, for the initial testing of this card, my plan is to just write some ROM code. Either something I can monitor to confirm all is operational, or preferably, to get the CPU doing something visual with my TMS9929A video card. But this video is probably long enough already, 
So we'll leave the code in final testing for a part two. So to be continued. That's it. Thanks for watching.